Hey, good morning. Ed, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Great. Well, I'm really pleased to be able to join with you today. And I got to confess, I'm dealing with a little bit of a technological challenge in that my laptop screen has uh, bit the dust. So I'm dealing with a secondary screen here uh, in Massachusetts where I'm visiting family. And I'm going to share the screen and let me uh, make sure that we can see it. Um, and then hopefully you can still see my presentation mode. That work? Yes. We can okay, see good. It. Great. Well, uh, what I want to do today is tell you a little bit about my research and specifically touch on aspects uh, where libraries have made a big difference. So I'll give you a little bit of a personal context about who I am, how I got here, and I want to set up the, pr the problem really of uh, the context geographically for what we're going to talk about, and that is climate change and tropical mountains. And then I'll talk about two aspects of that really, deciphering paleoglacier archives, and then tracing impacts of modern melt before I summarize some reflections really about stories. And I want to just draw attention to the backdrop photo here. This is uh, in the Andes, and you can see me on the edge of an old moraine, which is a debris left by a paleo glacier. And you can see there's a series of lakes of different color, different hues, uh, descending below the modern glaciers, which are very high and steep. And they demarcate extensions of where the glaciers were in the past. And that's kind of one of the stories we're going to unravel here today. I work at the Bird Polar and Climate Research Center for my research group. I am a professor of geography, uh, but at the Bird Polar and Climate Research Center, my group is called the Glacier Environmental Change Group, and you can go check out our webpage. And really, I would just want to highlight a few aspects. What we do is, is really student-led, and it's interdisciplinary research. And we think about glaciers and environmental change on many different timescales. And I like to in, in sort of emphasize that we're very collaborative in the way we do research and interdisciplinary. And we rely a lot on those that have gone before us. And here's a picture of me uh, with the largest tropical ice cap in the world, the Kelkaya ice cap, which has made, been made famous by Lonnie Thompson, my colleague, for getting ice cores going back over 1,500 years. And there with me is Henry Brecker. And Henry Brecker uh, is at the Bird Polar and Climate Research Center, and he has now been retired longer than he worked. But he's got quite a legacy in photogrammet photogrammetry of tracing the volumetric change of these tropical glaciers. And I'll talk about some of his work and how it intersects with mine later, but he's just an example of one of many uh, of folks that we interrelate with. The other hat that I wear right now is the state climatologist for Ohio. And this is not an operation that I do by myself at all. What I've done is tried to initiate an office that we call the State Climate Office of Ohio or SCU. And our mission is simply to serve as data stewards to interconnect data and it's climatological in nature to Ohio citizens in a format that can make a difference to their lives. And so we have a number of different dimensions to what we do, including some communication, outreach, information services, and research. And there's our webpage, easy to remember, climate.osu.edu. And I draw attention to Aaron Wilson, who's really the brains behind a lot of our products, getting out weekly hydroclimate outlooks that are little uh, video podcasts you can watch. How did I get here? This is an interesting story in and of itself, and it relates to uh, mountains and my fascination with glaciers, uh, going back to when I was quite a young child and growing up in New England, hiking in the White Mountains, New Hampshire. Uh, by the time I graduated from college, I had found an interesting book in the library my senior year. And you can see it in the lower left here by a guy named Barry, Roger Barry. And uh, just so I get the title right, Mountain and Weather and Climate. I think this was the edition that I saw on the shelf uh, it's now into its fifth edition. Bear, uh, Roger Berry has recently passed away. But this idea that um, mountains themselves are weather makers fascinated me. And I was a mountaineer, a climber, uh, and it was in my senior year that I discovered that geology was something much more than mineralogy and petrology. And at that point, however, my history major was mostly completed and I didn't have enough credits to really go into graduate school right away into geology, but instead, took a class um, called Meteorological Aspects of Climate Change that opened up a door into geography. But when I was climbing Denali, I really realized uh, just how fascinating the mapping of these glaciers are when I encountered a guy named Brad Washburn, 
and again, books. Uh, and the way that I got into this was through his map making. He was the authoritative map maker of Denali and, and pioneered the route up Denali that we took, which is the West Buttress route, because up this ridge up to the summit. And his wife was with him uh, on the summit. She was the first woman to climb it early on. And when he first climbed this, everybody thought he was crazy. But it was a new route that now becomes the most safe way up that mountain. New perspectives on old terrain. And when I flew back from Alaska, I saw this. This is the Malaspina Glacier. And it's a, it's a Piedmont Glacier that comes off the, off the Alaska Coastal Range and hits the coastal plain and spreads out in this dizzying plastic array of sediment. And this is a satellite image, so this is false color composite. The reds are actually green photosynthetic material. Um, but it just fascinated me because this is actually the size of the state of Rhode Island. How glaciers uh, impact climate became something of a fascination. So I got into a master's program in geography and ended up going to the South Pole, thinking about snow accumulation. And I would say that it was this experiential learning in the field that was transformational for me. So by the time I was a PhD student, I knew I wanted to work on glaciers. I wanted to work somewhere in the Andes at this point and uh, ended up getting a Fulbright and doing some very in-depth look at glacial change in the Peruvian Andes and learned quite a bit by immersing myself in the culture. And when I went there, I only had a few archival research under my belt, a few articles under my belt that I found. Uh, this was before all these wonderful cross-reference databases digitally online. So I had this photocopy of a 1995 paper by a guy named Roth, which uh, was a famous guy from Madison. Um, and this other guy named that I thought was Ames. But of course, Alcides Ames uh, was Peruvian. And by the time I was done with my dissertation, I had not only found out who Ames was, but I ended up living with his family for over a year and then going back in subsequent years for many months. Um, and then for the next 20 years, we have continued our relationship by spending time in their home. Um, Alcides passed away in 2007. But what I learned from Alcides and from the interconnections of people in this environment was much richer than simply archival research in papers, because it really took me into the terrain uh, in a very integrated way. And so we've maintained our, our very uh, kind of close relationship with people in the environment so that when I go back with students now, we often hire porters to help us, uh, community members, we establish relationships and permissions to study in the valleys below these glaciers. And uh, I've been able to even bring my own family back. Here we are in sabbatical visiting some of the porters that I used to work with during my dissertation. So um, when I was given my full promotion to professor, I was also given that opportunity that the OSU Libraries offers to get a book dedicated. And this was the one I chose. At this point, I had come back from sabbatical and written a book chapter as part of the High Mountain Cryosphere book. And you can just see my quote here, my inscription. I selected this book because Earth's frozen mountain environments are of special significance to me and of much of humanity, but they're currently being transformed as the climate changes. Mountains inspired me to become a professor of geography and continue to be places I love to research with collaborators and students. I've come to know and value the editors of this book during my academic career, and I just sort of highlight the chapter. Um, but that's a nice setup. If you want to think more geographically and scientifically at why glaciers in the tropics are not just an oxymoron, but a really vital part of this integrated climate system, I would start from this perspective. When we think about the cryosphere, we think about the frozen water on the Earth's planet, it's good to remind ourselves that this is actually Earth's largest freshwater reservoir. So we take all the oceanic water, 97% of the water on the planet, freshwater, 3%, what's left of that. If you look into that 3%, you can see that the majority of that is actually locked up in ice. Okay, so ice caps and glaciers, 68.7% of the freshwater. Then you have groundwater, and then surface water is just a very small percent, 0.3%. If we look at water in Peru, it's a very water rich country, actually, 4% of Earth's freshwater. Well, mountain glaciers, if you add them up, uh, are still much smaller than those continental ice caps of Antarctica and then the largest island, Greenland. Um, but if you add them up, you get about, well, it depends on when you start counting. Uh, in this particular look, you can see that if you add up the 650,000 square kilometers of mountain glacier ice outside of the ice caps, 
you see that it's about one, two, three, four, five and a half Ohio's. Where are they distributed? Well, much of it is actually in the Alaska coastal range. Think of that Malaspina glacier I caught my eye. Central Asia, also known as the third pole, ringing the Tibetan plateau, the highest extension of the Earth's uh, lithosphere. But if you look carefully uh, and then you think about lower latitudes, you don't see many little dots there because you're within the tropical range. What I've bolded here are the lines of 30 degrees north and south of the equator and stuck up there also a histogram of the world's population by latitude. And this kind of encapsulates a lot of the motivation for us to look at these small remaining tropical glaciers. Although they're very small relative to the rest of the ice masses, they're very critically located next to human society where much of uh, humanity exists, but also has persisted and adapted to environmental changes over a long time range. So this here's my view of the intro of the tropical Andes and a view of what the mountains look like now. Uh, and a reminder that in climate space, those tropical latitudes are dominated by the trade winds. And you put this large topographic barrier in the way uh, of the Andes of above 3000 meters is in the light gray and above four in the darker gray. You can see uh, the context in which we find these glaciers. But I like to also just point out that this physiographic complexity offers really intriguing uh, locations for us to study glaciers in the tropics, how they're different from the higher latitudes, but also to think about their impacts to people, not only now, but over longer periods of time. The imperative is uh, kind of enhanced when we think about what might be happening in the future. And this model output in the upper right demarcates temperature projections for the end of the coming century. Uh, and you can see that they get warmer as you go up in altitude. And I kind of displaced the graphic when I switched screens so that blue circle doesn't quite hit the Cordillera Blanca. But if you could imagine this oval shifted over to 10 degrees latitude, you can see these summits of the Andes where the Cordillera Blanca is in the central Peruvian Andes are gonna get uh, five to six degrees warmer projections. This is a model output and that's quite alarming. So these glaciers are exposed to, to differential warming at elevation. And uh, fundamental geography would also remind us of the energy dynamics of the tropics, which makes this a very special place. And I like to sort of show this graphic of April 2013, a daily montage of weather that you can really get a feel for how dynamic weather is. And I like to juxtapose this with uh, how weather is not the same thing as climate. But what's great in this context of this talk is to just look and appreciate the differences by latitude of how the tropics are in this weak easterly projection of easterly winds around the tropics. But we see the clouds that are puffy and white. This is convection that gets very deep through the troposphere, uh, very different from the mid-latitude westerlies where we are in both hemispheres. But you can notice if you're, if you're really a careful observer, you can notice the different Coriolis effect and how storms rotate counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere and clockwise in the southern hemisphere. And if you think about this, this is a result of the, the way we get energy to the planet, much more concentrated solar input at the lower latitudes. Well, you combine that with this topographic context as a result of tectonics of how the Andes are a result of this collisionary uh, plates of the Nazca plate colliding with the South American plate into this longest continuous mountain range on the planet. Well, you add those things together and you get quite interesting gradients and precipitation. As you can see this transect uh, uh, of color showing the dry and Peruvian coastline, which is a desert juxtaposed with the, and, uh, with the Amazon basin to the east and those mountain ranges. And you can see the star right at about 10 degrees south latitude. That's the Cordillera Blanca. We'll talk about sites there. Um, what this means for glaciers is they're quite unique. They receive net accumulation uh, through a half of the year, really, their wet season, uh, which is a time in which that those convective systems are concentrated as a result of the solar thermal, the solar insulation max. And, and these glaciers are receiving maximum accumulation at the same time that they're also melting at their most. So that we end up with a really unique mass balance regime that's very different from the higher latitudes that are seasonally cold and winter accumulating. Whereas here you can see that we have a wet and dry season and this bright, low, high concentration of energy input to the glaciers in the dry season, that they don't have a very clear snow, snow cover uh, 
they can ablate quite a lot through uh, melt. So uh, this just is important just to remind us, I know that we're talking to a general audience, but uh, we think about glaciers, they are different by hemisphere when we think about energy and mass balance. However, they're all ice and they all behave in similar ways. What a basic definition of a glacier is, is that it's an accumulation of snow and ice that doesn't melt, it starts to accumulate and flow of its own weight. The only force acting on it therefore is gravity. But as a result of this, you end up with a, a system where snow and, and, and ice is accumulating usually at the higher elevations and then down towards the lower elevations, it's melting off and you end up with a consistently conveyor belt like motion of moving and, and eroding. They're quite powerful eroders. So you end up transporting a lot of debris towards the end of the glacier. And so uh, what we can use then is these locations in the environment where these moraines um, have been left and deposited to reconstruct the extent of past or ancient or paleo glaciers. And then um, think about how those were representing a different climate in the past. So we can demarcate when those glaciers reached a certain extent in a valley, uh, even though there's no ice there now, we can then think about what kind of climate would have had to have been taking place at that time in the past uh, for that glacier to grow that big. So it gives us an important look as an archive into the extent of climate change. And those low latitude settings with high energy inputs um, are really uh, interesting. And so I've really framed my research in this domain around a couple, many different questions, but a couple that I'm gonna to just touch on today are, would be this look at the past. Um, and on the left-hand side, you see a photograph of the steep terrain of the Cordillera Blanca at nine degrees south of the Peruvian Andes. And uh, in the forefield, you see these parallel hills of moraines indicating about 10 kilometers down valley, those glaciers extended much further in the past. And so into the, what we call the Pleistocene and the hall, we can ask are just, well, when did the glaciers reach their maximum extent? And how did that relate to other places in the world, like in Ohio, where in Columbus, Ohio, we were covered by a half mile thick slab of ice about 20,000 years ago. How did the timing and extent of glacial advances in the lower latitudes relate to the higher latitudes? Especially when we think about the fundamental forcings that might be orbital. And then the question might be, well, what's happening currently to those glaciers that are now receding really fast? What kind of impact is that melt having on human society, specifically through water supplies? So these questions are very geographic. They, they relate to patterns in space, time and processes, different scales, and really also integrate nicely into the physical as well as human dimensions. So that's kind of where my geographic is situated. The questions that motivate the scientifically, well, at the last glacial maximum, if we take the maximum volume of ice in the planet, most recently that was 20,000 years ago. And you can see here in this graphic on the lower left, this is a computer output. You can imagine this land ice of the, the large Laurentide ice sheet covering all of North America and even onto Ohio. Sea levels were much lower, but these are reconstructions from paleo data from around the world, and they suggest that the lower latitudes around the tropics really didn't have as much of a temperature change as the higher latitudes. So how in the world did glaciers extend as far down valleys they appear to have been? And that's one of the curious questions that started my dissertation as a graduate student. But then also more recently, we've been more focused on this idea of, well, there's less glacier coverage now might be increasing the seasonality of runoff in streams below melting glaciers, even at a time when demand is increasing. So we might be seeing some situations into the future where water supplies might be threatened. So those are motivating questions, but to sort of highlight the process in which we get information to tackle these questions, uh, just imagine going to a, a, a setting like this in the Andes where the, again, the glaciers high and steep currently, but well down valley, this is now uh, a colleague of mine raising his hand, indicating a wetland that we were gonna core to look for some radiocarbon material behind these low moraines to figure out just how long ago the glaciers were filling this valley trough. How do we get information from the field in this form to ultimately provide the data that we need to make some models, to get some inferences and analyses about what the climate would have been like back then. And to do that, we gotta start uh, doing all sorts of stuff. But the first thing we want to do is get a, a constraint on the time and spatial extent of those ancient glaciers. 
To do this, we go to the moraines and we dig into the dirt, literally. And we do all sorts of different techniques to get chronology. And it's very difficult to get datable material in this environment. So we can look for soil development as a proxy. So here we are on a moraine, um, getting a soil pit and comparing the ages and plasticity of the soil sediments, sieving it out to look at relative soil development as an age proxy. You can see the moraine trim lines here that show these glaciers are much larger in the past. So digging pits in till at 5,000 meters in the Andes is quite a lot of work, but there we are as graduate students. We also go to the lakes dammed by these ancient moraines and get radiocarbon material to date in the lake sediments from lake cores that look like this. And then more recently, we've been able to develop a technique called cosmogenic radionuclide exposure age dating by going to the moraine and looking for rocks or erratics, uh, specifically like granitic is a really good material. And we chop off column, a kilogram of material and we bring it back to the lab and we can look at uh, the cosmogenic nuclides that accumulate as that rock has been exposed after the glacial advance. These are all ways to get dates on the moraines. And once we do that, we can come up with maps like this uh, for a valley. This photograph shows what the moraines might look like, damming lakes well down valley of the modern ice. And you can see the chronologies for this particular valley in thousands of years before present or BP. And this allows us to then reconstruct where the glaciers were in the past and, and then think about the volumes of ice that went through the phase changes and think about the rates of deglaciation. You can do all sorts of comparative analyses. That's one aspect, but then it gets really interesting because we got to compare sites from one valley location to another and then build that picture out to other regions through the tropics and then globally. So here's an example of some of the output of geomorphologic and glacial geology data. You can see a timeline of the Pleistocene to Holocene transition in time in kilo years or thousands of years, going back 130,000 years down to the bottom of the chart. And these are little interesting blips of uh, curves with quite a lot of question marks uh, indicate that we can sort of pinpoint time ranges based on these relative dates and absolute ages of maximum minimum constraining ages, but there's still a lot of uncertainty because the glacial moraine record is fundamentally discontinuous. So if we had a glacial advance come subsequent to another one that was older, but it was more extensive more recently, it would obliterate all the evidence that was there. So there's often very difficult to fill in gaps of time and space. So we have to start to get lots of data. We got to start to compare things. And it turns out that the people that like to do this research love to go to the field. It's rather expensive to go to these far remote high places to get data. It's rather expensive to get radiocarbon dates. It's even more expensive to get um, cosmogenic nuclide exposure age dates. And so there's uh, quite a lot of data out there, but it's often not published. So um, I just wanted to emphasize that archives are not just in the libraries. They are in the libraries and library research has provided incredible important background information. But what, we, what I had to do as a postdoc was organize a meeting to try to get all the data we could from folks that we knew were working in this arena. Um, and actually made them go back to their field notes because a lot of this stuff gets uh, recorded but maybe it isn't fully published. And so we held the first international snow line workshop back in 2002 and ended up with a special publication in 2005 uh, to get those kind of archives together and collated into a database. So we can get um, what is often relative and a lot of qualitative information and try to put it into more of a rigorous framework where we could uh, really quantitatively evaluate the extent and age of glaciers in the past globally, specifically at the lower latitudes. And so you can see just some of the results. If we look at the change in that paleo equilibrium line um, between the modern and the last glacial maximum, uh, we could see in a graph like this is there's a huge amount of variability even within similar places. So uh, this intra-regional variation was quite surprising. And it indicates that if you spend a lot of time and go to a specific location, like say you go to 10 degrees south latitude uh, and you go to one glacial valley and you get an age date, that may not be quite representative of the entire range. Because if you go to multiple valley sites, you can see that you might get quite a different extension of glaciers for that same time span. So it's really important to know that local factors modulate 
that glacial response to climate. But to quantify this took a lot of archival research and cooperative collaboration with field notes and other archives to pull all this together, uh, ultimately into a database like this, where we were able to look at interesting patterns uh, where you see larger or smaller extent changes at the LGM. And just to show you other places in the tropics uh, where there's glaciers currently like Africa, here's Kilimanjaro, and you can see some of the extent of paleo glaciers. Uh, and what's interesting here is this superimposed map on a digital elevation uh, rendition of the topography shows the qualitative maps that were done by a guy named uh, Henry Osmiston back in the 1960s that turned out to be incredibly valuable because he took the time to sketch the three-dimensional output of these moraines, which we were then able to put into our database and do some qual uh, more statistically rigorous evaluations of the paleoglacial extents by reconstructing the volumes of these ice masses and look at the changes in that ELA by aspect. And you can see a lot of interesting patterns here. I'm not expecting you to get quite follow this. What I want to show you though, is that you get a lot more data points, each one of these representing an individual glacial valley. You could compare the climate response, which is the change in that ELA by elevation of the headwall, by aspect, which is the degrees of compass direction that the glaciers faced. And you can start to piece together and start to infer what climate variability there was locally as opposed to the regional climate signal. And we can do this globally and you see a really interesting pattern that the ELA tends to, the change in ELA tends to decrease when your headwall elevations get higher. And uh, this led to a really interesting conceptual model that suggested that there's a topographic control on just how big or small a glacier can get as a result of the fact that the higher you get, you get less area so those lower glacial tongues that may be extended further down were much larger, but didn't have as much of a, uh, a topographic change and therefore have expressed a larger volumetric and climate response. So uh, very interesting input from archives. I would just stop at this point from this first section and wrap up by saying thank you to Carol Cavaluzzi, who is my librarian assistant at the Heroy Geology Library at Syracuse University. This no longer exists. Now I know that through libraries and maybe universities around the country and the world, um, where there's local libraries, they might be assimilated into larger library systems. That's I think what happened at Syracuse. But when I was doing my postdoc, after I finished my PhD, I kept in touch with Carol and sent her a request to get photocopies. This was before a lot of these um, publications were digitized to pull together archival research into all of these old glacial uh, extents from around the world. So Carol was a really invaluable asset in our publication. So thanks, Carol. Okay, another way in which we take archives of glacier change and we think about tracing the impact um, is more along the modern ice and its melt water impact to society. And in this context, what I've done in my research is collaborate with uh, human geographers, social geographers, and we put together a group called TARN, uh, the Transdisciplinary Andean Research Network. Uh, the idea here was that um, we could study with certain physical processes what's happening. We could measure the volumetric change in glaciers. We could think about the meltwater and look at its relative input to streams. But that's only one part of the story. We need to also think about talking to people that are living in these catchments to find out really what the impact of climate change is. So it's not just a simple climate change is impacting glaciers that cause meltwater uh, that goes to society. It's much also more of an integrated system whereby glacier changes and society are integrated uh, back and forth. So there's a real imprint of humans onto a hydrologic balance in the access of water. And it turns out that in this context, there's not just climate that's being imposed on the glaciers here, but the water demand itself is much more uh, of a rich human story that's coupled to a global integrated market. So this is what we call the critical convergence of different dynamics, not only human, but physical, to think about this system. I circle the A in TAR. Now TARN, if you know what that actually, the abbreviation handily is a word, TARN uh, is a glacial lake. And so we made the A into a profile of a glacier mountain. 
where we have our glaciers up high and there's the glacier lake and then the stream waters flowing down. And so what I'll do is follow this uh, in my depiction here of our research. But really what we're trying to do then is connect the glaciers and the people. Again, scale is a critical factor in our analyses as geographers. We're thinking about how these glaciers are melting and transforming into water, but then thinking about the processes and flows not uh, between where this ice is way up high in the catchments to where it's being accessed all the way down to the coast. And what you see in the bottom photo is what happens in Peru at the uh, current state of affairs on the desert coast. You can see the desert depicted here, but it's, when it's irrigated, it can be quite verdant. And these pipelines that you see are actually transporting water from glacial headwaters from a river called the Santa River that drains the Cordillera Blanca to the Pacific coast and transporting it all across the desert coast um, into about four different natural watersheds to irrigate produce all sorts of agriculture. So really connecting these two has been a fascinating field of research for us. The, the, the concept basically that we have receding glaciers that we can measure. We know that they're receding and they're accelerating the retreat. We know there's a global forcing of that. Locally, we, we know that that meltwater then gets into the four fields in the pro-glacial valleys and they provide an important buffer to the stream flows but it's also being mixed with groundwater. And so when we follow that stream then all the way down to the coast, to the desert, where we have these redistributions by human society, not only uh, to irrigate, but also along the way into hydropower production, we can see that these rivers become an important water supply. And so when we evaluate change, we really need to think about a lot of different dynamics to evaluate the impacts of climate change in this setting not just the physical meltwater properties. So here's the A from Tarn. And uh, you can see that this is a map from a more simplified schematic in a nature news review that, that covered what we were doing uh, to think about this idea that following the Santa River from its headwaters up here that drain the Cordillera Blanca glaciers to the coast of the Pacific, you can get a lot of insights into the water supply and usage of that water. And what you see along that transect, going from high up in the catchment at the glacial output to the midstream parts of the Rio Santa to the coastlines, um, is it tells a really interesting story. And you can see some of the ways in which people are interfacing with this water. Up high, there's a lot of agro-pastoralism and mining. And we have a lot of hydropower production and coastal irrigation. But the point that we tried to make uh, in our integrated transdisciplinary research approach was that we can't really separate humans from this story. So um, we wanted to think about studying water, not separately, but integrated with society. Well, first of all, the glaciers. And this is what uh, a typical glacier looks like in the Cordillera Blanca. The, med or the median size of glaciers is actually a square kilometer. This is the famous Yana Murray Glacier. And this is the one that I first saw published by that guy I thought was named Ames, but it's Ames. And Ames was trained as a topographer. He grew up in a Quechua speaking village and he learned how to be a surveyor. And this skill turned out to be invaluable. And in the early photos, he was actually next to a boat model. He was a very fastidious, detailed oriented person. Uh, that was his hobby, making boats later in his life. But, um, and scale replicas at that from scratch, <laughs> very, incredibly talented, but as a topographer, his detailed records allowed us to look at the volume change of a glacier like the Anamare. So he started mapping this when the glacier actually covered this lake. This is 1998 when I first got there. In 2015, you can see how small that glacier was. It's now pretty much gone. But that just shows you not only the extent of glacier loss, but if you look at the thickness, um, you can see just how much volume is lost here. And it turns out that when we measure and quantify, quantify that volume, it's changed about two to 12 times greater than you'd expect if you just predicted from the area alone. This gives us an opportunity to do a lot of creative analyses in space and scales, like thinking about the digital topography that we can rendition from satellite images and GPS. We can get a feel for um, reconstructing the 1962 positions from aerial photographs and compare that with GPS surveys that I did during my dissertation, we can get surface elevation changes and get a total volume loss. Very interesting, uh, but very labor intensive. 
Okay, and here we are getting to those glaciers with mules and setting up GPS transects and having to go across glaciers with ropes. I then got some money from NASA to fly a LIDAR, which is basically a laser detailed altimetry measurement, which gives us a really good view to again, do volumetric changes of glaciers, not just the area. And so we saw some really interesting patterns that you'd get a lot more volume loss than you would have expected from just the area that if you measured from just overhead area. And the reason for that is related to a lot of the radiative feedbacks um, as these glaciers are receding um, around the edges effects. And we've been able to quantify that with even more uh, subsequent research with infrared imagery and even drones. Well, if you follow then the, that rubric of going from the glacial headwaters into the stream of the Santa River, you can start to ask questions like, how is the stream flow changed as glaciers melt? Um, in the short term, you might expect to even see more water. And uh, how are we able to sort of track that progression? And so what we did is found out that a lot of the instrumentation that had initially been set up by the Peruvian government in the early part of the 20th century was abandoned due to all sorts of interesting uh, social forcings and political forcings, uh, including a neoliberal trajectory that privatized a lot of government agencies and downsized offices. So we went back and tried to reestablish some instrumentation using what we called sustainable tech. So lower tech ideas of measuring height of water with things like pressure transducers that would be small micro logged uh, computers that could be more uh, low profiled put into the environment and free from vandalism and yet pretty low tech to get height changes. We were able to go reinstall places that had been set up in the 50s with large uh, cement block structures like this. Um, you have to calibrate measurements with actual measurements of flow speeds from time to time. So we collaborated with our local engineers to set up a discharge rating curve and then we were able to model this system and show where we were on a progressive transition of loss of glaciers providing in the short term a boost to discharge. So in this graphic little cartoon, you can see as the glaciers receded, you get this Q or the discharge to increase. And you can see uh, that then it would then decrease after a certain point. And the difference between the initial point and the end point is what we're really interested in. But we can see in the process we also get a more variable flow without the glaciers to stabilize this charge. So I'll just play that one more time. You can see what we've been able to uh, theoretically compare with actual observations. And so that process involved, again, some uh, low tech sustainable observations compared with, coupled with some modeling. And we were able to then diagnose where all these different tributary catchments to the Santa River were located on this hydrographic transition past the peak water. Many of them, including the entire Santa as an average, have already passed the peak water. Now, this was an unexpected result because a lot of people had thought, well, the glaciers might be melting now, but for the short term, for maybe a few decades, we'll have a lot more water. Well, our results suggested that actually some of those catchments are still pre-peak water, the more heavily glacierized ones, but the ones that have been less than uh, about 30% glacierized, they've already passed peak water. And this then sort of portends that as we increase our demand along the coastal irrigation projects that are demanding more water, for example, you might end up with a situation of increased demand and lower supply. Well, we also had to figure out how people were perceiving change that were living up high in the catchments. So we did this with our human geographers in collaboration and we started to ask questions about how people were adapting, how they perceived change, what their livelihoods really looked like and how it intersected with water supply. And we found a very rich and complicated story. It's not a simple water from glaciers is disappearing and people are uh, suffering directly from that loss. Instead, what we saw is a very uh, integrated economy that has actually some rich uh, multiplicity and kind of high resilience to change because people are able to diversify livelihood incomes. But we also found that there was a real perception not only of water uh, loss, but um, or not even just a short-term gain, but water 
changes overall, but also a change in climate variation in temperature. And so, uh, and the change in seasonality in which precip was arriving. And these impacts on the agricultural production were quite uh, surprising and quite stark. And when we looked at the overall production for the entire Santa River Valley, you can see that more traditional crops are decreasing in their relative amount, whereas production of cash crop for export that's happening largely on the coast with that water being enhanced from the glacier melt was increasing dramatically. And this uh, last asparagus bar in this bar chart goes way above 200% change because there directly was no asparagus back at pre-6-1960. And now if you go to Giant Eagle, you can look, you can see a lot of asparagus comes from Peru. And it's being produced in the desert. Well, as the glaciers melt back, there's also the reality of higher and steeper remaining glaciers that are more susceptible to avalanches, which can leave uh, quite a legacy. And in this part of the world, uh, there's been very destructive avalanches. In, in fact, in 1970, there was a big earthquake that set off a rock fall from the highest peak in Peru, Huascaran, that set off this deadly avalanche. It was the most deadly single slide event that buried completely the town of Yungay with an estimated 15,000 people. And it set like cement so that people weren't even able to be exterred. So this is now just all a holy field, Campo Santo. Now this happens in smaller um, extents as the glacier lakes grow, they're dammed by unconsolidated sediments of moraines. And again, in a tectonically active area, if you get any kind of activity to seismically, you might shake off a chunk of ice or even as it just falls and melts, they could fall into these proglacial lakes and set up standing waves that could then breach the moraines and set off big mudslides below. So this is an acute concern for the Peruvian engineers that have set up a huge amount of uh, works to try to stabilize the moraines and also lower the levels of the lakes through siphons like here at Palcacocha. Well, we took uh, a tour then to follow the river from the Santa, uh, along the Santa River and measure the quantity of that water, but then also to start to analyze the water quality, because that's the emerging issue as well. As we change the hydrologic regime, we're also having lots of human activity that alters the chemistry of the water. So we took samples all the way down to the coast. And you can see how the discharge decreases dramatically after this point down close to the coast, where they divert 85% of that discharge along this what they call the mother canal to irrigate large swaths of production along the desert coast. And these are uh, big irrigation schemes. This one's called Chavi Mochik, Chav E Mochik. That's a four uh, river valley named abbreviation for the different river valleys that this canal transects. And then all this irrigated area. This has come online progressively over time. And you can just see how impactful this has been for job production really important and the Peruvian uh, export production of asparagus. Well, as you look at this holistic picture, we can get a, a real feel for a lot of intersecting variables that, that are important, not just in terms of a water volume, but uh, the demand for that water and the water quality itself. And that's been then the locus of a lot of follow-up questions that we've, we've been researching as a group. And so in this picture, you can see a time scale with a lot of messy curves. The green one just shows the decrease in discharge, but the increase in variability. So the red curve with higher amounts of variation in that flow indicates that as the river's now losing volume, it's becoming more irregular in its flow. At the same time, that we put more and more demand. And you could put that demand as a number of different variables. This one just shows the production in, of hydropower capacity. And then imprinted on here are shocks to the system like El Nino and La Nina that come on periodically, not as fully predictable. And then also depicted in the watershed here on a GIS coverage where we've uh, demarcated in gray, all the pixels that represent active mining claims and the legacy of mining is also quite impactful to water quality. So Chavi Mochik and other massive production schemes on the coast are great for the economy of Peru, which has been growing. Um, however, it's also highly vulnerable to the glacier-related disasters and variability. When you think about 
what this means in a long-term production sense. And so we've uh, started to think of this system in much more integrated terms, thinking not only of the water where it is, but also its elevation and its accessibility by different end users. And so this has led to uh, a whole rich view of research that's then um, something to consider over longer periods of time, like the fact that Peru has a long history of adapting to changes. The Caral site is one of the oldest cities in the Americas located in this desert environment, right along some of these river valleys draining to the coast. And the questions become, how have they adapted over time to these shifts in water regime? It's a very rich field of study. And there's a lot of indications throughout the Peruvian countryside of highly adaptive engineering works to grow and produce lots more agriculture than is currently being produced in the same environments. Here's the Inca Machu Picchu sites with some terraces and some coastal uh, structures of water reserves. So people have been doing a lot of water engineering. The Colcas is one of the deep valley uh, incisions of these rivers that go to the coast. This is one of the deepest canyons on the planet. And you can see terraces, uh, thousands of these terraces, which take a long time to develop and only about 10% are currently being produced or currently being used to produce food. So the point here is that there's a lot of uh, indications that, that people have adapted to this environment that we might learn from these engineering works as we go forward. And so some recent laws are encouraging the, the use of natural solutions to the shortened water supply, the more irregular flow, maybe retaining water into the ground, uh, and then thinking of ways to use even wetlands to help improve the water quality. Okay, um, I'm gonna stop there. I just wanted to make a few summary comments that uh, when we think about the future, we're adapting to a hydrologic change. It's gonna depend as much on social values and perceptions as and economic and governance as it will on the physical supply of water from glaciers. Uh, so getting back to a different view of resource and well-being, the local versus the global, we have a very diverse local expression of climate change, uh, as opposed to this maybe more universally forced warming. So a systematic understanding or integration of sustainable embedded observations, uh, as well as modeling and social science. And one of the keys to all of this is to have an open source of sharing data. So that's something we've been trying to uh, perpetuate ourselves. Okay, and then also archiving and rediscovering of science stories can be a really vital component for research. And this is just an idea I've been dwelling on as I thought about this talk, because we've learned a lot from the past, from people that have been there before. And just as a postscript to that deadly avalanche landslide of 1970, I wanted to just pose the scenario that, that came to me when I first got my Fulbright, I ended up uh, wanting to work with Electro Peru to work on this story of glacier meltwater currently. And they had all the data of precipitation and discharge. But in the midst of my application to the Fulbright organization, this Electro Peru was privatized and downsized and all the office was disbanded. So I couldn't work with them. So I had to scramble and got another institutional affiliation with the Geophysical Institute, which at that time, 1998, had no interest really in this subject, but they were very kind and said, sure, we'll give you an office. And when I landed in Lima um, and got started on this subject, the director of the Geophysical Institute gave me this photocopy, this old photocopy of, of an article from 1962. And if you look at it, what you see are the pictures of three folks, two North American scientists and their Peruvian uh, assistant, and they're rock climbers, they're ice climbers actually, they were mountaineers that had been up the north face of Huascaran. And they had been there just after a previous 1962 landslide that had gone down a valley, uh, quite destructive. But when they climbed this north face, they saw this precipitously hanging piece of rock that they thought was even more potentially destructive. So when they came down the mountain, they warned the city of Yungay that they might be in danger should there be a subsequent avalanche. Well, unfortunately, they were turned out to be prophetic, okay? And uh, in 1970, that's exactly what happened. And that city was wiped out completely. 
when that rock fall set off an avalanche. Uh, and you can just see the, the landslide pictures here. Here's the city of Yungay before the slide. There's the cemetery. The cemetery hill was preserved and about 150 people that were able to get to that mound survived the slide. And this is what the city looks like in the holy field now. Well, it turns out that um, when I published an article in 2008 reflecting on this experience, um, my point was simply that we might have scientific insights, but it may not always translate to social changes. Okay, they were warned, but there was a lot of suspicion about these scientists. There was a lot of dynamics between the Peruvian government and these researchers from North America. Um, and I didn't really know the full depth of the story, but I published this as sort of a postscript in the article to suggest, well, you know, we may not know how to do this well, but I think it's important that we try and we get to know people better and work on this interface of science and its understanding. And it turned out that the guy, one of these guys read my article. One of them died um, about 20 years ago, but one of them's still alive and his name is Charles Sawyer. And he got in touch with me because in my uh, read of this event, I had suggested that it really wasn't a rock fall, it was kind of a glacier collapse. And he wanted to correct my misunderstanding. Um, but in the process of communicating with him, he told me this, not only were our warnings refuted by the government, but they threatened us with jail at the time if we did not recant. Young guys, council declared a day of celebration for our bravery after this publication in the newspaper, but nobody really moved. So people didn't leave, uh, the city stayed intact. And so after the destruction of Yungai eight years later, I was so discouraged with months of clinical depression that I abandoned my career in biochemistry as a futile exercise, got married and raised family. He ended up in Australia. So the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, there's ways in which we can revisit a lot of events in these environments and learn quite a bit, but also share impactful stories. Um, turns out that Charles was quite a mountaineer. They pioneered this route up Tulparahu, as well as Huascaran. Here's a photo that I took from the very same valley and you can see the changes in the ice mass. So we can actually use these as research tools as well to put together more of the story and the tapestry behind us. But uh, it's really the people that make that difference. And I think that uh, for librarians who are interested in archiving, I think there's ways we could work together to make say story maps or other ways to preserve um, histories of people's experiences as well as uh, just the documented science that's not often um, enhanced and often takes a rediscovery process um, to come to light over time. And then finally, I just wanna say uh, that, that the COVID uh, scourge has been devastating. Here's one of my good friends in Peru that passed away as a result of COVID. And I just wanted to just say thanks to Freddie and all his work and remind and re just remember the many others that have passed away that have made these insights over time and just a reminder that human, um, that this, this endeavor we call science is fundamentally a human one. So with that, I'll end the appetite grudges if we have time. I know I've probably used up most of the hours, so sorry about that, but um, thank you for attention. And I hope this was at least uh, somewhat thought provoking. Thank you. We have we do have a few minutes for questions. So uh, two related questions were about the Amazon fires and how they affected the glaciers. And somebody followed up with, uh, such as, uh, has it affect light absorption? Yes, that's a great question. And um, so the way that we would track this, of course, would be to try to identify the source of dust accumulated on glaciers high up in the Andes. And this is something that has been attempted to, to be done. It's an interesting collaboration with mountaineers. So some scientists have been able to have those brave folks that are up there climbing anyway, to grab samples of the snow accumulating and then take those back down. Uh, and then you have to analyze the properties of that dust to find out if it's actually from Amazon fires to make that link. And some of it has been done. Uh, there's an effort now to reconstruct this in longer time using the ice core record because uh, that Huascaran um, was the site of Lonnie's drilling in 1993 and then they used up all that ice and analyses. They went back in just last year, or two years ago, 2019, and got another couple cores, not only from the call, 
between the two summits, but at the very summit of Huasca. And their hope is to look in more detail at those kind of stories. Um, yeah, fascinating to think about how fires might influence the ice mass. If you get a lot of dust on a glacier, especially given that hydrologic regime that I set up in the introduction, where you have a lot of accumulation in one season and then a very dry season. Well, it turns out that you, you reduce the precipitation or you put a layer of dust onto that ice as it goes into the dry season, that darker color will absorb more radiation and cause more melt. So I have a shout out to thank you for talking about uh, data management. Uh, so the people working in that area are glad to hear uh, shout outs to managing and retaining data. Uh, there's also a question about where are the glaciers in Papua New Guinea? Yeah, so you're going to hear from Ellen Mosley Thompson, I believe. And so she's really the person to talk to, although I shared in that analysis when we, we modeled kind of the future of that glacier, it's disappearing really fast and they're all but gone. I, I'll just leave it at that. And uh, not only would encourage you to think about the aerial extent, but again, the thickness of that remaining ice. Uh, is there a dam or other construction to capture the runoff? Yeah, that's a great question too. So what do we do if we're losing the uh, glaciers which are effectively buffering stream flow because they act as like a bank storage of precipitation? Can we help resolve that by putting in some dams? And that's the solution that a lot of people think makes sense. However, you have to balance putting up dams with the reality that you're in a tectonically active setting. So that if, I, if you dam up a lot of water, you've ended up, uh, you have to think about the impact if you have a big dam collapse. Right, and a lot of these sediments are unconsolidated, so to, so building in that environment is risky. But there are definite thoughts about how do we retain that water, and some of the solutions are not just dams, but also to think about using wetlands or helping to encourage groundwater infiltration um, by taking that water that's naturally running off the glaciers and trying to in, help enhance through trenching or other efforts the infiltration back into the groundwater where it's less susceptible to evapotranspiration. So again, heavy. Uh, rain in one part of the season, but also very bright, high altitude, um, intense radiation leads to a lot of evaporation and sublimation. So if you have big standing waters in dams, it might be one way to reserve water, but you're also potentially losing a lot through evapotranspiration that way. And I think we might have time for one more. Um, beyond the physical evidence, have any older historic, uh, such as 18th century, uh, paintings, etchings, sketches, et cetera, provided any useful data and evidence of the extent of the mountain glaciers? Great question. And that's certainly the case in the Alps and places where we have um, a lot of Western art. Um, now in this part of the region, we have European presence as of the 16th century. And we have documentation that goes back that far about glaciers existing, but not really enough to make measurements from. That only gets going um, later. So the first monitored glaciers go back to the 1930s, but uh, there was a mapping expedition to the Cordillera Blanca in 1932 by the Austrian, uh, German Austrian Mountaineering Club, where they took some very detailed metric uh, measurements of glaciers and, those have been, and photographs, which have become really invaluable. I would also make a shout out to Innsbruck for their library archive of those photos, which have provided a lot of really valuable um, time positions of the glaciers and allowed some more nuanced look into when glaciers actually kind of seemed to have went through a growth in the 1940s, like a stabilization. So it's not just been this uniform melting back from the 19th century, uh, but there's some inflection to that, which is really about valuable for us to look at because these are highly sensitive glaciers. So I'd like to thank our speaker for today, Brian Mark. Uh, I did put his uh, email address in chat. If you want to follow up with him or if we did not get to your question, please feel free to follow up with him. Uh, and I'd like to thank him for coming to visit us today. And uh, thank you for uh, telling us about your research area and connections to libraries and even into archives. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Uh, keep up doing what you do. I really uh, value all libraries and archives. So kudos to you all. Good luck. Thank you.